Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today is the 14th of March 2023 and I'm going to be bringing you lots of things that you might have missed from the Commonwealth Day service which actually happened yesterday. Um, also I will be telling you at the very end of the video what this brooch is because it is a royal replica. Some of you may know already. Okay let's just get straight into one point that came up quite a lot in the comments over the past maybe three, four or five videos ever since I've been talking about royal styles and titles and trying to explain them. Um, and I think most people that watched my videos kind of understand now about royal styles and titles, especially in relation to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and the new Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh. But there was one thing that kept cropping up time and time and time again. And I, again, I went to great lengths in the comment section to try and correct people but I think it's better to just address it uh, address the elephant in the room so to speak um, so that everyone knows and I have no idea where people are getting this false information from but it is out there and there is so much fake news out there that sometimes it's just good to correct it so what I'm talking about is the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's HRH style um, so HRH is not a title it is a style and Harry and Meghan do in fact still have the HRH even though they do not use it formally for work purposes and this is where the confusion I think arose from um, when Harry and Meghan decided to step back there was a statement from Buckingham Palace and I've got it in front of me right now I will pop a picture of it on the screen um, and part of it says the Sussexes will not use their HRH titles as they are no longer working members of the royal family. That statement does not anywhere say that they do not have them anymore. It doesn't say that they were removed and it doesn't say that they are in abeyance. Abeyance means basically a state of temporary disuse. It just says they will not use them. They still have them. They just won't use them for work purposes. Um, and the reason why it's not in abeyance is because we have seen, again, I'll pop it on the screen, as recently as Princess Lilibet's birth certificate, where Prince Harry actually used his HRH officially, even on a Californian birth certificate document, he still used the HRH. So, this, and if Harry has his HRH, that also means that Meghan, as his spouse, has hers. Um, so whatever state Harry is in, in terms of titles and styles, that directly affects and relates to Meghan. Um, so let's not be confused. Harry and Meghan most definitely 100% have the HRH styles and titles. They're not in abeyance. They can use them on formal documents. They have done in the past few years. They are just voluntarily choosing not to use them. So if they did start using them again for work purposes, that would be going against this statement, which was agreed, of course, under the late Queen Elizabeth II. With the issue of Lilibet and Archie, now that is slightly different. I do believe that their HRHs are actually in abeyance. In other words, they still have them, but they can't officially use them. And of course they wouldn't need to because of course, their children. Uh, but when they do reach the age of 18, they will be able to choose whether they want to take up those styles and titles. Um, well, the style, I suppose. Uh, but they can also decide for themselves whether they want to keep the prince and princess that Harry and Meghan decided um, to use on formal documentation. Um, but also, it doesn't just um, relate to age 18. They do not have to make up their minds at 18 and that decision sticks for life. They have all of their life uh, where they can choose whether or not they want to take up those, those um, styles and titles officially um, because it is their birthright unless King Charles or William in due course change the rules. That is the only exception. Okay, so the next point uh, of topic that I want to talk about is, of course, the Commonwealth Day that happened yesterday. Now, this happens every single year, and it's a chance to celebrate the Commonwealth of Nations, of which King Charles III is now head of. Now, being the head of the Commonwealth is not automatic. It started, of course, with King George VI, the late Queen's father, and then um, 
it, it was kind of taken on uh, by Queen Elizabeth II. Of course, all the Commonwealth members agreed that she was able to become the head. And then we saw famously as well, the Queen, the late Queen express her wish that her son, Prince Charles, Prince of Wales, as he was then, should, uh, should succeed her uh, as head of the Commonwealth. But it's not a done deal. All of those Commonwealth members at the time had to agree, of which they unanimously did, that Charles should become the head of the Commonwealth upon um, Her Majesty's passing, which of course happened. Um, so this was his first Commonwealth Day service. It's held at Westminster Abbey, and the royal family were joined by a 2,000 strong congregation, which is roughly what there will be for the coronation as well, to, celebra to celebrate the remarkable organisation which is the Commonwealth, as well as hosting a reception after the event at Buckingham Palace, which the Commonwealth Charter was signed by His Majesty. The 56 countries which make up the Commonwealth work together on the most pressing issues of our time, from climate change to youth opportunity, education to global health. Commonwealth Day provides an opportunity to celebrate the diversity and achievements of the organisation and its citizens. The Commonwealth Day theme for 2023 is forging a sustainable and peaceful common future, highlighting the active commitment of the Royal Family of Nations to support the promotion of peace, prosperity and sustainability, especially through climate action, to secure a better future for young people and improve the lives of all Commonwealth citizens. The King and the Queen Consort were greeted outside Westminster Abbey by members of the Nagati Renana London Maori Club as they arrived at the Abbey. Now, I watched this actually uh, very late last night because I wasn't feeling very well yesterday in the afternoon. So I spent most of the afternoon in bed whilst this Commonwealth Day service was going on. But I did catch up later. And one of the things we've been talking about, of course, is the order of precedence over the past few videos. And we did see that play out. We saw more junior members of the family in attendance arriving first. And obviously the most important with when it comes to arrivals uh, comes out last. And so of course, King Charles and the Queen Consort, Queen Camilla arrived at last after everybody else. We'll talk about the arrivals uh, in a moment. So those of you who are watching the service may have noticed that yesterday was a little bit windy. It blew over my mini greenhouse in the garden. I had to go chasing it. So I was fearful for any of those royal ladies or any lady in attendance wearing a hat uh, because uh, it was at risk of blowing off. Seriously, it really, really was. So you saw uh, Catherine gripping her hat. You saw Camilla gripping her hat. And when uh, Charles and Camilla arrived, it was particularly gusty. And Camilla did not want to hang around. I mean, you could tell that her hat was at severe risk of blowing off and, I don't know, flying off somewhere into the crowds. So she kind of hurried in. I think a lot of people thought, oh, is she being rude? Is she kind of sort of, you know, skirting past um, the performers who were doing amazing, beautiful performance? Um, as always, somebody is chosen outside to greet members of the royal family. I will say it did look a little hurried. I think Camilla did scarp her in a little bit too quickly. I think she could have held her hat a little bit longer. Um, but I can understand why she was worried about those gusts. There was also a photo I will put up of Camilla almost having her Marilyn Monroe moment. So we were almost at risk of seeing a flash of the Queen's undergarments, shall we say, um, which we don't want to see. We do not want to see that. So I can understand why she hurried in, but in terms of in terms of visuals and optics, it did look a little bit hurried. Charles, of course, didn't have the issue of anything blowing off, so he stayed and sort of watched that greeting a little bit uh, more intently. Uh, but the performers were amazing; they always are. Whoever is chosen always does a fantastic job, and of course, it is a big honour for the country of origin of the performer to perform the greeting. Um, outside for, for all the guests in attendance. Now, one thing I should say about Camilla's Marilyn, almost Marilyn moment, the late Queen always had little mini weights um, sewn into the hem of her dress, whatever she was wearing. Uh, 
especially on day visits when she was outside, just in case there was a gust. So the queen, the late queen, was never really at risk um, of, um, of having a Marilyn Monroe moment. So maybe the queen consort, uh, Camilla, should take a little bit of a note and get some weights sewn into the hems of her dresses. Uh, right, so moving on. Um, no, let's go back a little bit. Let's talk about William and Catherine. So William, he just looked like William. I mean, what can I say? For the men, in terms of royal fashion, there's not a lot you can do, is there? I mean, it's a suit. You know, that's sort of what they have to wear. They have to wear a suit. Now, you know, going back to the days of Edward VIII, um, you know, when he was, well, the Prince of Wales, Edward VIII, before he, was, before he was Edward VIII, was the Prince of Wales, before the abdication, he used to dress quite flamboyantly. You know, you always saw him in brightly coloured sort of trousers. And, you know, he, he was a bit of a trailblazer for royal fashion. I don't think we've seen the likes in terms of male fashion within the royal family since. Uh, it's always, you know, the appropriate suit or when they're in public, you know, in private, they're sort of dressed down or they're in country attire. So William just looked like William. Um, I would like to see him change up his fashion a little bit. You know, he's still a young man, uh, but the suit was appropriate for Commonwealth Day. Catherine looked absolutely resplendent. I do believe she was wearing Erdem, holding on to that beautiful glamorous hat that was slightly askew. Um, she was wearing sapphire and diamond earrings and we saw her wearing uh, the Prince of Wales feathers pin brooch. Now, uh, don't be fooled, this is not an ordinary pin brooch, it is diamonds, and I do believe it has all the... Now, I tried to zoom in, and thought all I could see was the green um, jewels, but I couldn't see the... Um, I couldn't see the red rubies. It's supposed to have some, some red rubies as well, and I couldn't, I couldn't quite make it out. Uh, so I'm sure they're in there. It perhaps wasn't picked up on the camera. Uh, but now, of course, Catherine is the Princess of Wales. She can wear uh, the Prince of Wales feathers jewellery. Uh, and of course, there was a famous Prince of Wales feathers necklace, uh, which Diana wore as Princess of Wales, and Camilla wore it technically as Princess of Wales as well. You may or may not know that as the wife of uh, the second wife of the Prince of Wales, as Charles was then. Camilla was also Princess of Wales. She just didn't use that higher title. She chose to use the Duchess of Cornwall out of courtesy and respect for the late princess. It would have been very controversial if she'd used the Princess of Wales title, but she technically was. So she had a right to wear the Princess, uh, the Prince of Wales feathers jewellery, of which there are a few pieces. Um, so Camilla did actually wear um, the same sort of necklace and brooch as, well, it can be converted. The Prince of Wales feathers necklace can be a brooch or it can be also um, in necklace form. But this is the pin badge. I think it looked beautiful on Catherine on Commonwealth Day. I loved the colour on her with the outfit, um, carrying a beautiful clutch, and she was uh, exiting Westminster Abbey with a bouquet of flowers. So I thought that looked really, really amazing. Camilla in kind of royal blue. I don't think it's purple. I think it's a royal blue. She always looks amazing in her hat. Her millinery is always uh, of an exemplary standard. Now, the brooch that she's wearing, you may not have noticed this. Um, she was wearing a brooch that was formerly worn by the late Queen Mother and, of course, inherited by the late Queen. Now, as part of the Queen's Jewels collection worn by Camilla. Now, it was, I suppose, an odd choice in terms of the name of the brooch, especially with what's going on in the world right now. But that brooch, it's a kind of gold, it's got a gold mount, and then you've got this huge sapphire surrounded by um, a kind of circle uh, uh, of diamonds. So it's a beautiful, but it's actually called the Russian Sapphire Cluster. Um, again, a bit of an unusual choice, maybe, with what's going on in the world, but it was a favourite of the late Queen and the, the, the uh, late Queen Mother as well. And we do know that when the late Queen Mother passed away, a lot of the jewels obviously transferred to the Queen, but were then on long-term loan to Camilla. Um, so it makes sense that Camilla was kind of wearing that jewel. Also, it fit in beautifully with her outfit. 
So I can't blame her for wearing it. So a little bit more information, just backtracking slightly on the Princess of Wales uh, feathers pin. It was actually created, first created for Princess Alexandra of Denmark, who was wife of King Edward VII in 1863. So it does have, you know, quite a, a long-standing provenance within the royal family, although still, I suppose, one of the more recent pieces of jewellery in the collection. Many are still of Victorian um, era and and before Victoria. So it's nice to see these jewels being worn. It's nice to see them being used. Um, yeah, I, and I can't wait to see what tiara. Uh, I mean, I, I imagine the royal ladies are going to wear tiaras at the coronation. If you look back at old photos of the coronation, lots of the royal ladies also wear a ducal um, coronet, or if they're, if they're not of a duke rank, a duke or duchess rank, um, a coronet that relates to that status in the, in the nobility, like the Earl's coronet or a Baron's coronet, whatever it might be. Um, so, for example, we see Princess Margaret, I think, at the coronation of her sister, wearing a tiara and a ducal coronet. Will Catherine wear a ducal coronet and a tiara? If so, which tiara will she use? Will it be a new one? Will she be debuting a new one um, from the Queen, from the late Queen? Queen's collection. I do not know. And that, these are the things that we can speculate on and the things that are really fun to think about. Also, um, I don't think coronation fever has actually hit the UK yet. Normally, with these big set piece royal events, we, we're normally a little bit slow to catch on. We normally like, we normally like to play it a little bit coy um, until about two weeks two weeks, a week before the event, then we will go coronation crazy, seriously. Um, so preparations are underway, as I said in the previous video. Um, the rehearsals are taking place. There has been a mock-up stage created at Buckingham Palace. I think it's likely to be in the ballroom. Um, so preparations are well underway, and I cannot wait to see what people are wearing. And will we see these ducal coronets come out? What tiaras may they pair them with? Oh, I cannot wait. Once inside, of course, there were lots of performances um, and it was just really fun. I mean, there was a really fun, lively vibe and we saw lots of smiles from the royal con congregation, uh, which was in a very stark contrast to the last time Harry and Meghan were in attendance, where there was quite a few uh, glum faces on display. Um, so I will pop a few pictures in to show the contrast between, you know, between the vibe, I think the vibe was a lot better. But one other thing that may have gone unnoticed, which is a little, little bit revealing to me and makes me backtrack a little bit on my earlier, one of my earlier videos where I made, you know, I made a remark. So I'll tell you what that is now. Um, on the order of service, it's still listed the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh as the Earl and Countess of Wessex. So obviously we know that these are printed in advance, you know, perhaps five or six weeks in advance. So that tells me that there was not time to change the order of service and update it to the, to the new Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh titles, um, which tells me that it wasn't the announcement that of, of the uh, Duke of Edinburgh title being conferred or upon Edward, or the decision to do that, was not as recent, was not as planned as I initially thought it might have been, um, which indicates that perhaps it was a little bit more in response to Harry and Meghan revealing that at the christening they had decided um, to, to use the birthright um, titles of Prince and Princess for Archie and Lilibet. Um, yeah, so I'm going to revise what I thought. This indicates to me that the royal family were a little bit on the back foot still with the news. So I'm not changing my mind on that. I think the I think Harry and Meghan didn't tell them that they were going to make that announcement then. Um, and I think that that kind of sped up, I think, perhaps King Charles to make the that finally make the decision on Prince Edward and what to do with that. And of course, there was not time to change the order of service on the coronation day sheets. 
Um, so yeah, I just thought that was something that may have been missed in the mainstream media or, you know, people talking about the royals. So that kind of just makes me reflect a little bit on perhaps, you know, the, t the timings of those announcements. Okay, so I will also pop a picture of uh, King Charles's Commonwealth Day uh, speech and message. I, I won't read all of that. You can pause the video and hopefully read that for yourselves if you want to. Um, but kind of a big comment and take from that is that the Commonwealth has been a constant in my own life, and yet its diversity continues to amaze and inspire me. And I think King Charles talking about its rich diversity um, really sums up what he is about. He has devoted, people forget that he has devoted, you know, a huge part of his working life, his working royal life to the Commonwealth, all the endless overseas visits that he has made. And also um, the people that he supports, even within, for example, the Prince's Trust, you know, come from all over the Commonwealth if they're in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, and it's a young person that needs help, they can come to the Prince's Trust um, and get that help. So King Charles really has had a wide reaching role throughout his adult life within the Commonwealth. And he really does respect diversity. And that is shown in the many different faiths, um, interfaith kind of groups that he, he supports. Um, and there was also, you know, talk previously of him being defender of faith and not just the faith. Um, so, so Charles really is a big player in the Commonwealth circles, and I don't think he often gets that recognition. I think sometimes, you know, it's put down to very um, base things, and you people forget to look at the amount of work that some an individual actually does, not just in front of the cameras and and the press, but also behind the scenes as well. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Commonwealth was so ready to accept Queen Elizabeth's wish that uh, that Charles succeed her as head of the Commonwealth. And it also goes to show, I think, where William needs to concentrate some of, well, a lot of his efforts going forward in the future. He needs to really step up and build those relationships with the Commonwealth. And William's got quite a big job ahead of him. The Commonwealth is changing um, and, you know, the royal family do need to negotiate a way forward for itself within the Commonwealth. Um, things are changing and also William has to um, affiliate himself more with Wales as well, which he now derives his Prince of Wales title from. So he's going to be doing lots of work, um, you know, in relation to the Welsh. Um, and like I say, I think he and Catherine need to show, um, need to step up and do a lot more within the Commonwealth. William is already doing lots of global work, of course, with the Earthshot Prize, uh, which affects the whole globe. But I think what we will see in the future, once the coronation has taken place and once uh, Charles himself and Queen Camilla have had a, a bit of a tour of the Commonwealth, um, I think it'll be William and Catherine's turn to really get to know the Commonwealth well. Um, so yes, that is something that I look forward to. Okay, so before I go, I want to talk about this brooch here. It is Queen Elizabeth's flower basket brooch. And this is a replica uh, that I bought from Buckingham Palace website. They don't, I don't, they do a different version, but it's not the exact colors. It's more mu muted tones. Um, so they don't actually do this particular replica anymore. Um, it was actually given to the Queen in 1948 by her parents and it was a present to mark the birth of her first child, of course, Prince Charles, who also happened to be a future heir to the throne. Of course, we now see him as King Charles III. So this is a brooch that the Queen wore for over seven decades. She loved it. It was one of her favourites and I think it's really, really nice and beautiful for spring. Um, it sort of heralds it's a really cheery brooch and I just really, really like it. And this replica, like I say, they don't do it anymore. They do one with like really muted colours, um, but this is the exact replica and I love wearing it. So thank you for watching this video. If you have enjoyed it, please give it a big old thumbs up. Don't forget to share on social media and of course do hit that bell so that you know whenever I upload 
a new video. So from me, to you all, and goodbye.